This is the Roaring Elephant podcast. And I'm doing this very quickly now because my co-host Dave, who is my usual counterpart here, is doing silly things and needs to stop. So I start to record. Hi, Dave. I mean, no, really, more or less silly than usual, so... Uh, yes, but my patience apparently has its limits, depending on the day, so... <laughs> I know, but that's what I enjoy, is finding the the limits testing of those limits. limits. Testing exactly. the limits, it's called. Yes, exactly. yes, yes, yes. And we've been testing the limits of other companies around the world in our last uh, four or five episodes, I think, by mm -hmm. looking at what they pre pretend are their values and how they are pretending to change the world and of course we cannot do that without being as honest and also talking about what we think are our values now our little podcast doesn't really have a value statement or a mission statement to be honest but we do have values yeah and at least at least these are also values that we have come across along our journey uh, through various corporate uh, lifestyles and have taken something from them, yes. you know, have, have found some value of those values. We valued the values. Indeed. Because we're we not going to be talking about the values we didn't value. <laughs> we're only going to talk about the ones we picked up as, yes, this makes sense. This has changed my life somewhat. This has made me a better person. Or at least I hope so. <laughs> yeah, Indeed. So let's go into it. I've made slides again, so people listening in MP3s and not watching on YouTube, you're missing out again. <laughs> but the first value we have here is assume no malice, or otherwise phrased, blame incompetency before bad intentions. And uh, the the sort of less um, less politically correct version that you won't see on the slides, uh, that I quite like is it's probably cock up not conspiracy yeah but it's not because you're paranoid and not how to get you <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> i mean this this to me is really this is i mean a, a, many of these are sort of foundational in some way shape or form but this one i think might be one of the most foundational ones um and uh, there's so much of this um, that I think is about uh, about trust, about trusting that you know people around you are also trying to do the best that they can, maybe with you know without having all of the picture or without having all of the context, or you know that they're, they're also trying to do the the very best that they they can with the information they have and the the ability they have and sometimes people trying to do the best they can may accidentally do things that you know wind other people up or f put other people in awkward positions or whatever it might be but and it's very easy to start to get into a sort of a, a confrontational or antagonistic sort of response of like, oh, why on earth did you do that? Like, that was, that's a ridiculous thing to do. That's, you know, caused me all these problems. And and then, of course, if, if one person starts off with some sort of level of antagonism or... Defensive um, behavior. Yeah, defensive behavior, then, you know, it immediately escalates. sort of escalates or snowballs or however you want to call it. And like this... This sort of this set of values for me are all about whenever something happens, sort of take uh, that you know triggers you in some way, shape, or form. Like, take a deep breath, take a step back, have a think about you know try putting yourself in that other person's position yeah. with what information they may have or how they might have perceived the situation, and you know even before you go and ask that person hey i'm not sure if you realized you know this put me in a bad spot but just start off with um yourself just pausing taking a breath having a think about the other person and their particular situation before you even start thinking about kind of responding or doing something else 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think also in distributed companies, distributed working environments, mm. and especially with the pandemic, people have been starting to work from home remotely, disconnectedly. A lot of the time, you don't see the face of the person anymore that you're talking to on a regular day. And writing emails is a skill. It's a bit of an art form. And a lot mm. of people really don't spend enough time writing their emails or Slack or whatever I, uh, I am messaging system you're using. Mm. And it's very easy to write something that's unintentionally brusque or hurtful or something yeah. like that. And while, okay, sometimes it's maybe obvious, but quite often people, exactly as you say, are trying to work with you, not against you. I do think that in our business and our job as pre-sales engineers, uh, we kind of train ourselves to write more carefully because we are mm. talking to our customers, of course, all the time. And you have to make sure you have to kind of assume that what you're writing is potentially going to be taken the wrong way. So I always try to make sure what I write is clear, concise, transparent, and as little room for interpretation as possible. But you yeah. can't expect that from anybody. And when I'm talking to internal internal clients, otherwise known as colleagues, I go faster. I may not do that quickly. And the better you know the person, the easier it gets because you know them yeah. and you know, oh, he means he means it like that. She meant it like that. Yeah. But with the bigger teams, when you get joined in a bigger distributed uh, project or something like that, it gets hard very quickly. And the problem is that once it happens, there's no way back. Because it's that whole first impression thing. Yeah. And when you have that impression, oh, he's always a cantankerous one. He's the one that messes everything up. It's very hard to get rid of the reputation again. So while I do like it, uh, it's a, a value that I have tried to be faithful to myself. I do, however, also would say that there's a bit of responsibility on the side of the person that initiates whatever it is to yeah. make sure that there is as little room as possible for a bad assumption on the uh, other party's side. I said parties yeah. a couple of times here. Yeah. And the other, there's, there's, oh, there's so much that sort of plays into this particular value, I think, because you've got, you've also got, you know, significant differences in things like culture as well, that, um, you know, if, if you've, if you've read a book called uh, The Culture Map, hmm. Uh, for example, it talks about sort of the differences in the way that different cultures will communicate different um, sort of different ideas or different thoughts. And, you know, moving from a high context language and culture to a low context language and culture, you know, communicating can be made very, very difficult. And you're absolutely right. Like the, there's this uh, this particular value, whether you use you know assume no malice or whatever, is very much something that um, only only really works if everybody is is uh, adopting it and yes. thinking about it. Um, you know, if it's all very one sided, then you failed <laughs> and that's why this i think is one of those really really important um say almost foundational values because you you need everyone to be on the same page with this like you can't just have um you know part of the organization thinking about this um you also brought up another one another really important point which i think is the um, the increasingly sort of remote first or at the very least sort of hybrid working nature of so, the way that so many organizations have gone um, and the nature of communication, like things, I think it's fair to say like the world continues to move faster and faster. Like we continue to sort of try and cram more things into our day and and sort of um, technology is moving faster, business is moving faster, the world it's, itself is moving faster. And the, the nat human nature is to, is to try, is will naturally try and, you know, keep up with all these things and try and therefore, you know, shorten the amount of time that you spend on things like communication. And often that's to the detriment of uh, to your point, doing writing something that is well thought out, hopefully 
can't easily be misunderstood or or misinterpreted. Um, and I think we have actually, I think this has become a, a larger and larger problem um, over the, the last kind of five years as so much more communication has gone through to, you know, platforms like Slack, mm -hmm. um, even kind of email had its challenges, but at least, you know, it, email tended to be more long form communication. You tend to, you know, start writing an email and then you finish writing the email and you hopefully you read <laughs> through it <laughs> and you make Assumption some adjustments. Danger. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Assumptions are uh, dangerous things themselves, but like, you know, you, you read through it, you review it, you make some corrections. You oh, I didn't actually mean that to sound like mm -hmm. that. And then, you know, you send it. Whereas the the nature of chat platforms like Slack it's are called instant messaging for a really for a reason. Exactly. Yeah, it's fast and furious. Like people shorten things. Um, people sort of spend the least amount of time possible to for the you know maximum bang for buck for every single word or letter they type, sort of thing. And it's much much easier for that to uh, i think like really impact the way that people communicate things yeah, and it's not just in the business right i mean these values are valid uh, everywhere because mm -hmm. i think 90 percent of all toxicity on the internet could be solved by this <laughs> and common yeah. sense but i think this has better chance yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and as andy would say common sense isn't actually all that common um now you mentioned the uh, human nature there for a, a while ago and uh, i've read somewhere that actual human nature is to be helpful first the whole hateful thing is usually a reaction based on perceived threat because a mm. lot of the times people read something and for some reason uh, the email has an expectation that somebody had that you would have done and you didn't do it. So you have to immediately start defensive and then you start yeah. reading the rest of the text in a defensive tone mm -hmm. and then you react to it and that's the whole escalation pattern, right? So the one thing, I've got a value coming up or we have a value coming up later uh, that kind of goes into this more in detail. But when you do read something, when you do notice something, if you have a Twitter feed and Twitter pops up and there's something in the first reaction, have a calm down think again and as you yeah. said try to figure out why the person wrote what he or she wrote in that way yeah and see if there's a way of making this a positive one and then reply as if it was positive because the fun thing is when you talked about it needs to be an all or nothing thing everybody needs to have this or it won't work well the great thing is that if you're in a minority to have this as a concept in the end you will win out because mm. positivity, and I'm a very negative person, I'll be the first to admit that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a positive optimist, whatever. But positivity does win out in the end. The negative people, if you only assume malice and always start from a defensive, argumentative approach, you will not get as far as people that can be strict, can be argumentative, because discussions are typically arguments flying left and right. Mm -hmm. But having just this one allows you to have an argument without hurting anybody, without that hominems and things like that. Yeah. Do you think there's um, do you think there's a difference between people who are earlier in their career and people who have been in the workforce for a while when it comes to this? Uh, yes and no. I would say yes because, uh, well, it could go both ways. That's what I mean to say. Because on the one hand, the younger people, they are more open because they haven't been hit by the hammer of reality as hard yet, <laughs> let's hope. So there's more optimism, perhaps naivete, if you can call it that. Mm. So they might be assuming no malice more easily, while people that have been in the business for like 30 years, and yes, I'm thinking of myself, uh, you start reading between the lines a bit too easy from, from time to time. On the other hand, younger people typically are more afraid uh, to lose their job, to yeah. not function correctly, to not be seen as whatever, which could again be a reason to have that negative reading of the message and get the escalation going. So I think it's both ways and it's also dependent on the generations. Now, typically I don't really go deep on the Gen Z, Gen X, baby, baby boomers, whatever, but there are differences there in how people uh, raise their mm. children. I mean, the whole mm. latchkey generation, which I'm a part of, 
has a totally different view uh, on the world as the millennials, for example. Mm -hmm. And that will also get in there because, again, expectations is what this game is about. Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I suppose I think about um, people maybe with a bit less experience in the workforce, you know, having having maybe a bit less faith in in sort of or knowing less what to expect and therefore you know perhaps being a little bit too literal maybe a little bit too sensitive um potentially sort of um falling into this this trap of um you know perhaps slightly more um slightly more assumption of malice because they they just don't know any different they don't know not to they just see something read it and go oh that's not good um rather than um rather than you know, taking that that deep breath and that step back and hence why um again why i think this is such a a really important uh, a really important value the other thing about this value is um this is a value that i think is applicable like all the way across an organization, like regardless of your level of seniority or, you know, how junior you are. Um, because if you're at a, let's say a relatively early or junior stage, for me, this value is about understanding how maybe decisions way above your grade are made. And are you saying I can't complain about management anymore. <laughs> I mean, you can complain all you like uh, about management of this podcast, um, but uh, no, I was thinking, and I was thinking, it's also um, for those folks that are um, perhaps more senior, and they see people operating or doing things that, like, that's directly contrary to what my expectations were. That you know those people would be doing or that team would be doing or would be delivering or whatever again like don't immediately <laughs> fly off the handle and and start berating all those people because you know, assuming no malice suggests that actually perhaps they they misunderstood the direction or by the time the message reached them through the various layers of management you know it it, it didn't land the same way as you're in, you intended and i just think this is one of those yeah, this this to me is one of those really really key values to instill across an organization. Yeah, I would actually say that management layers need to have this more in their mind than the individual contributors, as it's called. Because mm -hmm. being a people manager kind of expects you to not have rash emotional responses, mm -hmm. but have the maturity, the the, the background, yeah. the, the capability to reflect on what's being said, reflect on what's being reacted to, and see that's feedback. Now, there are, there are outliers. Some people just, I'm going to say a bad word that I can't say on iTunes <laughs> or Apple Podcasts, it's called these days. But, but people are sometimes just bad people and you won't, that, that happens. But typically, it's, yeah, a, a different expectation, expectation management. I always, when I mentor people, I, I tell them a lot of times, expectation management is everything. If you write something down, as long as the people have the right context the right expectations you come you can barely call there's no way to go wrong to be honest mm -hmm. the expectations are wrong if my sales rep promises something and i'm not aware of it and then i come in and do my job and that doesn't come that conflicts that is a very bad conversation so that's why yeah. of course solution architects need to talk with their uh, sales reps as often as possible make sure you mm -hmm. jointly prepare meetings things like that i'll talk about my job now this is applicable for everything that works in a team environment of course yeah definitely so yeah cool all right sounds well so easy, we like doesn't it? we it does it sounds it sounds so easy and yet it's very very difficult uh, i would love to, 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 to bring up some anecdotes but uh no. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and one, maybe one more thing: the the, the word that was uh, also called the incompetent incompetence factor. The person may be incompetent in what he what he or she is doing, but always may keep in keep in mind somebody put that person in that position. Yeah. So there's always somebody else who's also responsible for that situation yeah. at that point. Yeah. So, do we do one more? 
Yeah, let's do one more. Ah, less less lettering. <laughs> Home for dinner. The thing about this one is that I like it because it means more than just what it says. Because mm. home for dinner for me means respect. Respect the time you're asking of other people, respect planning, respect other people's schedules so that they can, between air quotes, be home for dinner every day. Mm -hmm. Does it always work? No. The emergency trumps reality every day. That this happens all the time, so whatever. But as long as I don't feel a second-rate citizen because I had my planning and someone just boing, put something in the calendar and I, now I need to show up and I have no, no say about it, that's just a lack of respect. And yeah. I like the way that it's a very simple phrase to, again, give very deep meaning, to be honest. Yeah. I think this one is one that, um, like speaking from personal experience, so many, um, uh, let's say, go-to-market organizations at early stage startups really, really struggle with because you tend to get sort of the type A personalities where like everything could be sacrificed, you know, people, their personal time, like nothing matters apart from, you know, closing Isn't another Isn't that the definition of a startup? Deal. Well, this is this is the this is the point, isn't it? Can you have? I I believe you can have a balance, but it is it is a balance. It is a situation that, in my experience, there's always some tension there between, you know, the the fast growing. We're all in this together. All go, no quit. You know. Every, every quarter is the most important quarter in the company's history kind of thing. And that sort of, but we respect our employees. We respect their time. We respect their, uh, we respect the fact that they have families and they have, you know, lives outside of work. Well, isn't the respect that is shown from a start of a company totally in the money? Because the whole idea of joining a startup is you set your life on hold, but you're going to earn, if it hits, you're going to yeah. earn a crap ton of money mm -hmm. and stock and whatever. And that's basically why you put your life on hold for. So, I mean, that's why I don't work for startups, to be honest. Yeah. I know I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't enjoy it. Yeah. I think, I think there's an element of that, but I still think, you know, organizations that are startups eventually grow into larger companies so you know the, and typically many of the startup people leave yeah that's that's another <laughs> that, that's another thing which is sort of you know some people have that sweet spot of mm -hmm. oh i i join companies when they're you know less than less than 100 people and by the time they reach you know a couple of thousand you know it's lost its attraction for me i want to jump back to that and you've got other people that, you know, oh, you know, once a company's got past a thousand people, you know, yeah. I love that journey from a thousand to, you know, 10,000 or whatever. And then you've got those people that are like, oh God, I wouldn't join any company that had less than 20,000 people. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it it's, I think there's, I think this value is, uh, I like the point that you make about it being about sort of respect. I also think that it's um, it sort of it's one of those things that you need to you need to understand. Like, is this the most important thing for you? For example, you know, is is it start up, put your life on hold, accept that there's going to be late nights, early morning, crazy travel, and all that sort of stuff. But as you say, maybe hopefully things go well but as long as it happens respectfully that's fine yeah because dinner doesn't need to be 6 p.m at my kitchen table mm -hmm. it needs to be private time when i put in my calendar and there was a i was a, it was an open spot and i put down i want to have dinner then yeah and it's again sometimes there's a reason uh i don't know world explodes stuff needs to be done <laughs> 
but unless it's an emergency and not that's something else i see in a lot of startups uh, is that everything is an emergency and if everything's emergency then there are no emergencies emergency. exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's a fun it's a nice way of just as yes, pressuring people and doing stuff that they don't really want to do by saying yeah but it's an emergency if you don't do this we're going to lose a deal and the company's going to go under or whatever well if the company's really going to go under for this one deal it should go under because it's a bad company yeah yeah so when when you think about this value like what's the is there is there a sort of a a group of people or you know we were talking about you know junior versus more tenured people we talked about um level of seniority in an organization you know is there a a group of people that you think that this this is particularly aimed at or particularly interesting for uh, I wouldn't say aim not interested for, but I'd say that different groups of people should look at it differently. Uh, the more tenured people, the older people, should have more respect for the younger people. Because the younger people, I'm not talking age, but in years of seniority in this case, mm -hmm. uh, again, there's more uh, fear of losing my job. If, I, if I'm going to say no, I'm going to be bad, I'm going to get fired. And senior people should realize that. And if a conflict comes up, in my case, I will always put the the interest of the junior person before my own. I'll skip my own dinner if that junior person can keep his dinner, because yeah. I don't want to force a junior person in a position where he has to say no, he or she needs to say no, which is much more taxing. I find it relatively easy to say no if I have a reason, <laughs> obviously. But uh, nowadays, if somebody comes, uh, I mean, this is an example. This recording slot was in my calendar for quite a while already. And somebody wanted to put a, a thing, uh, something else on top of it. And I said, okay, how big an emergency is this? Apparently it wasn't. So I said, no, mm -hmm. we can do it tomorrow. And again, I think it's management, but also for, cont uh, for individual contributors, there's teams with different, different seniorities. The, this is where the, the mentoring mindset should come in as well. And senior people, it happens not all the time. And I see a lot of times that it doesn't happen at all. But in my opinion, senior people should protect the junior people. They yeah. should show how it should be done and just apologize to the junior person and say, okay, this is a mistake. It shouldn't have happened. Uh, even if it wasn't my mistake, but for some reason, okay, one of us needed to say yes. Okay, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. No, I think that makes a lot of sense. What, where do you think are there any are there any areas where this you know can get misconstrued or or, or misunderstood? Uh, well, some people take it literally. They put these uh, lunch blocks and evening dinner blocks in their calendars, and uh, then the moment you put something in there, the assume no malice goes out the door, and you get a whole tirade of "How dare you put that on my spot?" And whatever, whatever. Again, it should always be flexible emergencies exceptions happen all the time but they should well they shouldn't happen all the time because again if they happen all the time they're not exceptions anymore but exceptions you should have a flexible mindset there don't take this super literally and again if somebody comes in and for this for the example I just gave if the person had said yes but this is because that person is available then and if he can't do it then then he'll be gone for the next six months mm -hmm. Okay, cool. It's there's a reason. I feel respected. I feel I feel actually feel valued because this is a unique opportunity and my presence is required to make this successful. Hey, this is good. This means I'm doing something right. I'm getting a vote of approval here. This is a good thing. But in this case, it was just an internal sync meeting. Yeah. Good thing is, I said no, and that was totally okay. So the person in this case, people they know how to work with me. But I've been here for a couple of years now, so I just asked. Okay, it's possible. No. Okay, fine. We'll look tomorrow. Nice, nice. Okay. Right. Well, I think that's probably about all we have for today. Uh, Is there anything else from you? Well, we have plenty more values, but it's all for today. Indeed. Well, in that case. You can support this podcast by becoming a patron. Every contribution really does help. We are on YouTube. You can like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, do all the YouTube things. You can go to roaringelephant.org for a link to our Patreon page and for more information about the podcast. You can follow us on Twitter, still currently, using the at Roaring Elephant tag and send your feedback to podcast at roaringelephant.org, maybe with your values. 
Until next time, my name is Oh So Valued Dave. And my name is, I work from home, so I'm always home for dinner, y'all. And we look forward to talking to you next week. Goodbye. See you then. Bye.